there are three types of heat transfer that we'll be interested in uh, recognizing. One is uh, conduction, uh, convection, and the third one is radiation. So conduction is when heat is transferred in a static media. It's analogous to the mass transfer process of diffusion, so there's no fluid flowing that uh, helps out the heat transfer in thermal conduction. And here's an example where there are these two cups of water under the, the waters at different temperatures and then there's this bar of uh, looks like copper that's put in the, the two fluids and you have heat transfer through the copper bar uh, from one fluid to the another and that, that's caused by uh, thermal conduction. Convection, though, this is a, analogous to advection, uh, the mass transfer process of advection, and it is when heat is moving in a, a flowing fluid. And we recognize two different kinds of convection. One is forced convection, where the fluid is um, flowing as a result of some induced process. And here's a nice example of a hair dryer uh, causing the flow of air. Uh, onto this person's head and you can see the heat transfer by forced convection. Uh, n free convection or natural convection is caused by the uh, density change that is produced by changes in temperature. So uh, when you heat up air, for example, the density is reduced and the uh, air becomes buoyant and rises and that causes flow. Uh, the, by uh, free or natural convection. And here's an example of uh, a Schlieren photograph with natural convection in the vicinity of this person's head. Uh, presumably you're having a process of circulation that's something like that. He can also be transferred by radiation. And in this case, you don't really have a, an analogy to mass transfer like you do with uh, diffusion and, and invection. Uh, in this case, the um, heat is being transferred by a difference in temperature between uh, two different, uh, different bodies. And uh, uh, heat energy can be emitted and absorbed, um, and there are, there's, there's no media required in between the two um, places that are uh, emitting and absorbing. So this is how uh, energy is, uh, thermal energy is transferred uh, from the sun, for example. So all of these things will be expressed as a thermal flux where we've got a, a energy, a heat energy per unit area per time. So that'll be the basic units of thermal flux. And of course we can combine the, the energy per time as a power. So sometimes you see it written as power per unit area. And these are some common units of uh, heat flux, joules per meter squared per second. Uh, heat energy as joules, um, or a joule per second as a watt, so you sometimes see this as watts per square meter. So radiation uh, is one of the three processes that we saw as an important way that heat is transferred, and uh, this is done by um, uh, Radiation transfers heat through electromagnetic waves. If we look at the electromagnetic magnetic wave spectrum here, uh, we see that this intermediate band of wavelengths from a few nanometers to about a millimeter is capable of uh, transmitting heat. Visible light is right here, uh, so from a little bit less to a little bit more than uh, the visible light spectrum we can uh, transfer heat. And the way that that works is that if we have a source of electromagnetic radiation and uh, it causes magnetic uh, radi electromagnetic radiation of the right wavelength to hit this body, then we could either have that radiation reflected, transmitted through the body, or it could be absorbed. If all of the incoming radiation is absorbed, then we call that a black body and we use black in quotes because it, uh, it is an idealized material that in fact will absorb all of the incoming 
uh, radiation. And another characteristic of black bodies is that it's a, a perfect emitter. And the, uh, the heat flux coming out of the black body is given here by Stefan Law, where the heat flux is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. And the proportionality here is the Stefan Boltzmann's constant. Uh, we can look over here at the units of the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's uh, watts per square meter uh, per degree K. And those are indeed the units that we would expect here if we, if we have an equation that gives us, that relates the heat flux to the temperature to the fourth power. So that's the heat flux coming out of this black body. And we might also imagine that under uh, other conditions, uh, we could have another body nearby. And that would be also giving off uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, like this. So here's another body nearby. And it's uh, radiating out uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. And the heat flux then is proportional to the, um, the heat coming out in this direction and the heat coming from this body in this direction. And so that's expressed over here in this heat transfer uh, equation. The heat flux depends on the difference between the temperature of these two bodies. And it's the difference between the temperature to the fourth power. And so here is this uh, Stefan Boltzmann's constant. And we also then have this term here called the emissivity. And the emissivity gives us uh, an expression of how effective this body is at, uh, at, at radiating out electromagnetic radiation. Uh, for a black body, this is, uh, has a value of 1. Uh, and for other kinds of bodies, if, for example, uh, reflective bodies or shiny bodies would have uh, emissivities of, of less than, uh, much less than 1. A uh, very reflective body could have a value of, uh, of close to zero, for example. And so you can see that this is kind of a, uh, a more general expression of Stefan's law. If we have, a, if, if this second body has a temperature that's very, very much lower than this temperature, and if it's a black body, then this is equal to 1, then we get, uh, we get Stefan's law. But in general, we'll, we use this kind of a relation to get the heat flux uh, by radiation between two bodies at different temperatures. Another way of transferring heat is by thermal conduction. This is Fourier's law of conduction here. And you can see that it's directly analogous to Darcy's law for flow through porous media or Fick's law uh, for conduction or um, diffusion of mass uh, through, uh, through material. And it gives us, this gives us thermal conduction uh, as a flux driven by a temperature gradient. And this is the thermal conductivity that relates the two. This is in one dimensions, and we use this gradient operator on the temperature to get the flux in, in general. That should be just QH without the X right there. So uh, here are the units. This is the thermal flux as energy per area per time. And we see here this is the temperature gradient, temperature over length. So the thermal conductivity must have these units. And here I just wrote that out in more detail. Uh, for the units of thermal conductivity could be energy per time, length, de uh, degree of uh, temperature. We can combine the energy and temperature here into power. And so you see it written as, uh, for example, uh, as uh, energy per length time degree or power per length uh, degree of temperature. OK, so that's thermal conductivity. That's going to be an important term to understand thermal conduction in heat transfer processes. Here's some examples of thermal conductivity of various compounds. Uh, this table is ranging from around 0 0.001, 10 to the minus 3, to say 10 to the 3 over about six orders of magnitude. And on the low end, uh, I, I compiled the, uh, the values here for different uh, things. It's hard to read this table. Uh, but on the low end, uh, thermal conductivity of 0 0.001 is a vacuum. 
and air is a bit larger, but it still is really quite low. Um, water is, uh, a, is, is a bit high, it's around 1 uh, watts per meter per degree C. And ice is a little bit higher than water. And then as we go up, the thermal conductivity of steel is greater and copper is greater yet, and the highest uh, uh, is diamond. Okay, so that's the range of thermal conductivities that we uh, expect for thermal conduction problems. We can see why uh, insulating materials uh, have a low density. They like to uh, trap air uh, and uh, use this low thermal conductivity of air to the, their advantage. And uh, thermoses will uh, create a space that is uh, a vacuum and use this very low thermal conductivity of a vacuum uh, to keep your coffee warm in the morning. Thermal convection is probably the most important process for heat transfer. Uh, when fluids are flowing, then you can have a very effective method of transferring heat from one location to another. So the energy flux in convection is given by this term, the, uh, the fluid flow, the temperature, the heat capacity, and the density. And so to just pull apart the units here of those different terms, this is flux, fluid flux, temperature, the heat capacity is the energy per unit mass per degree uh, of temperature change, and this is the density. So if we uh, cancel out these units, we get that the uh, this is indeed a energy flux, energy per area per time. And we recall that there are, are two different types of convection, forced or uh, free convection, depending on how the fluid is flowing. If, it's, if the fluid is driven by processes other than the convection process or the, the, the change in temperature, then that's a forced convection. Uh, and if it's driven by the change in temperature, then it's free or natural. So one of the important aspects of uh, thermal convection is the transfer of heat from uh, relatively immobile uh, regions to the mobile fluid. So either a solid uh, transferring the heat into a, a, a gas or a liquid, um, or the, the, a gas flowing over, say, a, a liquid that is moving much more slowly than, than the gas. And so what's important here is how heat is transferred from that immobile body into this mobile fluid. And what we envision is that there is a thermal conduction process right here at the interface. And if we zoom in on that little red box, we have something like this. This is the solid. Uh, there's heat stored in here. And we need to transfer that heat into this flowing fluid. And right here at the interface, there's immobile fluid, and heat is conducting across it. So this is directly analogous to the problem of mass transfer between a solid region and a flowing fluid. And the way that it's handled is using a, a technique that, that's directly analogous to the one for mass transfer, where the heat flux is proportional to the temperature gradient or the temperature difference between the solid and the fluid. The proportionality depends on the thermal conductivity and this thickness of this immobile layer. And often these two things are just lumped together to give us uh, this term uh, called H, or that we're showing here is H bar, that's the thermal uh, transfer coefficient. And you can imagine that there would be, if you looked very carefully in this region, there's, there could be a lot going on that's causing the, the heat transfer. Uh, and so this, uh, this H bar term is kind of lumping in some very small scale processes uh, into this empirical term that uh, will allow us to, to not model those small scale processes explicitly, uh, but still include their effects in the analysis that we conduct. So this term H bar, the heat transfer coefficient, it has units of watts per square meter per degree K. And it has really quite a wide range of values. Here are values from uh, a variety of different uh, scenarios, natural convection in gases for an experiment that involved this size of a vertical wall at this temperature. And there's this value for the heat transfer coefficient. 
And so we have another example where instead of a gas, we have a liquid and we've got a pipe and diameter of pipe and a particular fluid. And so these are different, uh, different scenarios and we have these heat transfer coefficients. This gives, uh, this table has a variety of other scenarios. And basically what this is, is a, a compilation of heat transfer coefficients that were measured during experiments. And we can see quite a broad range of coefficients. So it's going to be important to know what this coefficient is uh, or how it varies during the problem in order to, uh, in order to accurately simulate the heat transfer from a flowing fluid to a a solid and this could be to remove heat from a solid uh, say to cool it or to heat up a solid uh, from a uh, from using a hot fluid so if we look at this heat transfer coefficient in more detail what we see is that it it really varies over quite a broad range it depends on the type of uh, convection that's happening and it also depends on the temperature so if we look at a uh, compilation of just a, a broad range of natural convection experiments where the fluid is moving due, due to buoyancy, then the heat transfer coefficient is found to depend on the temperature, uh, the temperature difference between the solid and the fluid to a power that is ranging from uh, uh, one quarter to one third. So the, the heat transfer coefficient is, uh, is dependent on the temperature, but it's fairly weakly dependent uh, on the temperature. And there's a range in here of uh, 4 to 4,000 watts per square meter per degree C for natural convection problems. For forced convection, um, where the fluid flow is, is controlled, then this heat transfer coefficient is, is roughly constant. Uh, and the range of heat transfer coefficients is, is, is in here. Now, if you have boiling, then we have a, a very broad range of heat transfer coefficients, uh, and it depends on the temperature difference squared. So, it, so it's quite sensitive to the temperature difference, uh, and it has this broad range. And you can imagine why this is, because if, uh, say this is a, a, a boiling teapot, then the heat transfer from the bottom of the teapot into the liquid uh, is going to be very sensitive to the details of what's happening right at the interface. And during boiling, you have, uh, you have bubbles of vapor that form right at that interface. And the, the heat transfer through those bubbles of vapor will depend on how big they are, how rapidly those bubbles detach and, f and move up through the fluid. Uh, and so a variety of, of factors like that. So it's really quite complicated and those factors will affect the magnitude of this heat transfer coefficient. So determining what value to use for a heat transfer coefficient will be an important part of setting up uh, a, a simulation of advective uh, heat transport where you've got uh, advection trans transferring heat from a mobile fluid to an immobile immobile region.